Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 30th, 2015, and it's a ridiculously warm Pacific Northwest. I don't even know what to do with myself. My name is Chris, and if you can believe it, this is Tech Talk Today, episode 100. And 90. And there's a, raw, a, a smattering, I guess you could say. I was going to say a lot of news, which there is, but it's, it's a wide range of news today. And I can't wait to introduce our video theme of the week at the end of the show. So let's just kick it off. Let's get started. Time of Probes. Greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. Hola. Hello. I, hello. Yeah, so uh, there is much going on today. And I wanted to start with news that uh, doesn't affect us here in the U.S., but affects our friends across the pond. Uh, the European government is agreeing on some basic net neutrality rules with exempt with some exemptions. And these could be big ones, and we'll probably talk more about these on other shows, maybe this show in the future. Uh, but the European Union's three main legislative bodies, the European Council, the European Parliament, and the European Commission, have reached an agreement on the open internet rules that establish principles similar to net neutrality in the EU. The rules require that all internet traffic and users be treated equally, forbidding paid for pr uh, prioritization traffic. However, exemptions are permitted in particular for specialized devices where the service is not possible under open network normal conditions. That's a pretty big loophole, um, providing that the consumers and customers are using the service and they pay for the privilege. So some examples given were IPTV, teleconferencing, telepresence surgery. Um, zero rating, exempting particular data from caps, like you know how T-Mobile does for Spotify, which is essentially reverse net neutrality, is also permitted but will be subject to some oversight. Uh, here's something else that could be notable, although I guess this isn't the first time this has been promised to our friends across the pond. Uh, but it also promises the elimination of cell phone roaming fees within the EU. That could be pretty neat. So this could be major news for the Internet. Now, Ars Technica and a few others have written up articles that are very concerned about the loopholes. Uh, is anybody in the mumble room uh, current on this and, and uh, familiar with what, what some of those loopholes are? Because this is the gist that I've gotten so far this morning on this story. I'm checking the uh, chat room, too. Uh, all right. Well, I'll keep reading about this. Uh, we'll see what happens. I think the roaming fees, uh, yeah, Count Zero says in the chat room, the roaming fees are astronomical, and I have heard that as well, that they're pretty horrible before. Here's something that I'm not sure what to do about. I have been a huge, huge proponent and user of OpenDNS for many years. In fact, it's going to be, or I'm planning for it to be, a big part of my strategy for helping keep my kids safe online instead of having to load individual software and all that. Well, today it's announced that Cisco is buying OpenDNS. Interesting enough, ZDNet calls also OpenDNS a cybersecurity firm. Huh. 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 Cisco has announced its intention to purchase the threat protection security firm OpenDNS for $635 million. Now, yes, OpenDNS does offer some, some protection services like that. Now, this came out today, uh, and they, they say it will move. this move will help acceler accelerate the development of the Cisco cloud-delivered security portfolio. You know, really, the thing about OpenDNS that doesn't that it doesn't excite me isn't their uh, remote testing and all these things. It's their awesome DNS service, uh, and uh, I I'm I'm a huge fan of OpenDNS. Been using them for years. Chat room. Um, anybody tried them out? Ham Radio. Have you ever used OpenDNS before? What about you, Sean? Have you ever used OpenDNS before? No, actually, I was just looking them up. <laughs> yeah, well, they're pretty cool. So uh, um, I would go there right now, but they would be it would paste my public IP all over the live stream. Uh, so here's a gist of what what it kind of does. And if you're not familiar with it, it's really neat. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about their cyber security because I've been using OpenDNS for a very long time since way be well before they had to have cyber security services. And what it really is is you can go in there, and you can have an account, or you can not. You can just use them as a straight up great DNS service, and they'll try to make sure that some like bad things don't happen to your DNS. Uh, that's a very like uh, layman's rough like from the outside. However, if you want to make an account with Open DNS and actually maybe even have it like you know you can even have like a client on your machine that updates it when your IP changes so they know where you're coming from. You can do some pretty incredible stuff. You can do you can do DNS level filtering. You can block out malware sites and virus sites. You can categorically block out porn sites if you want, and it's all under your control, and it's only by using your DNS. And what's brilliant about that as a parent is you can set your router's DNS 
to point to OpenDNS, and then that filtering applies to all the computers on your network. Now, if you want to avoid that, you just set your local computer to like 8.8.8.8 or whatever, and now you can use whatever DNS, you can use the Google DNS. But your, the rest of your computers on your network will still be going through OpenDNS. This is great if you want to just kind of have a blanket level, semi-usable, safe filter and prevent even like accidental browsing of maybe like a gambling site or malware site for kids, whatever you want to do. OpenDNS, OpenDNS could enable and facilitate this for organizations or just for your home without having any kind of like filtering software on the client machine or anything like that. Uh, and uh, and Imacon points out in the chat room that OpenDNS also makes DNS crypt easier for him. So uh, the things that Cisco are buying OpenDNS for are, in my opinion, not its strongest assets. But Cisco knows more than I do, I suppose. Well, I suppose Cisco decides they can keep whatever aspects of it they want. Any other thoughts on OpenDNS? North Ranger, go ahead. Yeah, could you see uh, if uh, Cisco might be uh, moving to inst uh, kind of default to OpenDNS on their routers? Wouldn't that be cool if they kept around the DNS services and integrated in Cisco? Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and Cisco, uh, you know, router products, they're all Linksys. That could, uh, yeah, that could be really compelling. I hope they would do that. I hope they would do that and not and not shut it down and just... What I'm more worried about, the way they speak about, the way they talk about this, they say that the open DNS cloud deliver platform will also give Cisco better visibility and more insights into the threat landscape. I don't know exactly what they mean. Do they mean that by watching DNS queries, we'll get an idea of what malware is talking to what and looking up who? Or do they mean, I mean, or, or do they mean they want to, in, I, what I'm worried about is what Cisco wants to do is pull out some of the bits of OpenDNS integrated into Cisco's overall portfolio and drop the rest. That's what I'm worried about. Cisco has a hit and miss record when they, uh, when they purchase companies. I'm just a little worried about my, my baby. I love it. Uh, Azer asked, do, uh, don't you think they'll make it more premium service for their clients, eliminating the free tier? Maybe. Maybe. Cisco has a lot of money, though, and they're, you never know. Sometimes they're willing to, uh, to do that. We'll see. Uh, so this, hey, you know what? Actually, I have another Cisco story. Well, I, I was just thinking of this. Maybe we'll, care, we'll cover this, too, while we're on Cisco. Uh, Cisco is warning of two default SSH keys on some of their virtual appliances. Now, here's why that's bad. Because it's one or the other. Two total. For their virtual machine appliances, two keys total. Like for everybody that has the virtual appliances using one of these two keys, this is bad. Cisco released an advisory on the on this vulnerability. There are two separate SSH key vulnerabilities for the Cisco Web Security Virtual Appliance, Cisco Email Security Virtual Appliance, and the Cisco Security Management Virtual Appliance. You see, the problem is uh, they're all using the same SSH key or one of two. And so uh, I'll have a link in the show notes if you need to know more about that. We also have some coverage in last week's tech snap. And we'll have more if there's any fallout. So uh, Cisco sometimes has issues as well. This one is surprising. What the hell is Microsoft doing with Bing? Good question. They're uh, selling bits of it to Uber, and then they're using its ad platform uh, pretty aggressively. So remember that uh, AOL just recently uh, sold and uh, to Verizon. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't. I, I, anyways, I don't. We'll talk about that more later. But Microsoft announced a new partnership with AOL and AppNexus. AOL is taking over Microsoft's display ad business, including mobile and video ads in nine markets. Now, this is also interesting because Microsoft has been renegotiating their deal with Yahoo as well and retracting there. Ads sold will span both AOL's properties, such as the Huffington Post and TechCrunch, and Microsoft's online presence, such as MSN and Outlook.com. So, Microsoft's own websites will no longer be handled by their own in-ad agency, but instead by AOL. Uh, Microsoft will power search ads across AOL's properties. So when you do search on AOL's properties, those will be Bing ads. And it's a 10-year agreement. Wow. Wow. Now, remember, Yahoo uh, Yahoo and Microsoft are currently renegotiating their deal. Alyssa, or whatever her name is, Meyer wants out. Marissa Meyer. Or at least wants to scale it down. This is interesting to see, uh, to see kind of Microsoft big breaking up bits of uh, Bing and giving uh, like the imaging aspect of it to Uber. And uh, the ad aspect of it over to AOL. Microsoft's going through some transitions there. Uh, I also want to talk about Samsung. Samsung is having some pretty good success with Tizen smartphones, it appears, and it plans to build more of them. Samsung will launch several more Tizen smartphones in varying prices, a person said, without giving other information from Samsung. Now, they said it was too sensitive to be to, to be to be. Uh, identified, I don't know why, but they also announced that they have sold 1 million Z1 so far in India. That's the, that's the world's, India is the world's the third uh, lar largest smartphone market, and the uh, Tizen smartphone, the Z1, has sold a million handsets there. How about that? 
some serious ties in success. You know, we so we're so focused on uh, Android and iOS and Firefox OS and Ubuntu Touch. We don't talk about Tizen very much, but they just sold a million Tizen devices in India, and Samsung announced they're going to double down on that. All right, there you go. Sean, are you going to go get your Tizen phone now? Have you changed your mind? No, no, I think I'll just stick with the Android and <laughs> take, a, take and go with CyanogenMod. Oh, all right, all right. Well, okay, fine, fine. Hey, do you guys remember that story uh, that uh, I got interviewed for by our local uh, ABC affiliate? on the PayPal robocalling as part of their new end user license agreement. You remember this story? Oh, are you serious? Really? God, well, you... I remember that you looked pretty good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, Thank you, Count Zero. Okay, thank you, chat room. Thank you. All right, so, so most of the chat room remembers. Uh, yeah, so uh, PayPal is breaking away from eBay, and as part of that, they announced a new end-user license agreement, and in this, they said they could robo-call you and robo-text you. Didn't matter if you're not on the do not disturb list, and any of their affiliates could do it as well. A lot of people were upset about this. In fact, people were so upset about it that our local ABC affiliate showed up here at the studio and interviewed me about it. I did a piece for the local news, and I remember saying, you know, maybe they'll change their tune on this after the blowback. Well, guess what? It took them a little bit, but PayPal has now officially just outright killed. It's terrible, terrible bad robocalling policy. Yeah. So uh, they say in the new policy, we will not use auto-dialed or pre-recorded calls or text to contact our customers for marketing purposes without prior express written consent. That's according to the new user agreement. Uh, also... <laughs> <laughs> it also allows customers to keep using the service even if they want to opt out of the robocalls. So that was the other problem, is your only your recourse for opting out for PayPal was to close your account. Hey, you don't want our calls? Fine. Shut your account down. We don't care if you use it for your business. So uh, there you go. Took them a little bit. Bumpy ride as they become their own entity, uh, as they move out from, from uh, eBay. I hope they uh, checked for their Y2K bugs. So, uh, just an update on that uh, big OPM hack. Uh, in the wake of the hack, OPM, that's the Office of the Government uh, Employment Records, is uh, going to be shutting down for a few weeks. So, no, uh, no, uh, uh, they're calling it a temporary suspension to ensure that the network is secure as possible, which I guess they kind of have to do this, right? Uh, but it means, uh, I guess, I, I don't quite understand how this works, but I guess they're not going to look up personnel records for like multiple weeks. Um, and this is now the number, by the way, of the OPM breach, the number of people affected when they first reported the story was 4 million. Now, it's 18 million. Side note, the federal government employs a lot of people, and those numbers don't even include the military. <laughs> uh, yeah, wow. So there you go. So uh, if you want to get a job right now, you might, uh, for the government, I don't know how that's going to be going down. They're, uh, they're shutting down lookups for a little bit as they check their secured network. You know, th this whole OPM thing does kind of remind me a little bit of the Y2K bug. Uh, I'll tell you more about that, but there was a lot of panic and systems got shut down. I was involved in it. Um, but before I get to that, before I get to waxing on about that, I want to thank our patrons over at patreon.com slash today, 553 of you are supporting the Jupiter Broadcasting Network and our future endeavors and helping us keep it a little weird by being honest to our audience and not have to worry about commercial advertisers as much. I really do appreciate that because that changes the formula of our shows and keeps me excited. I really like that. It's nice too because I have a, I feel like I have, um, for some reason, that group feels more intimate to me. It feels like I, I don't know, like I, I realized uh, I did a video <laughs> in my kitchen for the patrons uh, over the, uh, f on Friday. So if uh, you're a patron and you haven't seen that yet, I've just posted that up for our uh, patrons. And if you're not one yet, you can go sign up and get access to this video and the past ones. I realized I just posted this video in my undershirt. Well, I just did a video in my undershirt. I guess I feel pretty comfortable with you guys. I didn't even need to put a shirt on. Or really comb my hair either. It doesn't really look like, oh, uh, I don't, kind of, I mean, Look at that. You really need to comb that. Patreon.com slash today. Support the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Get access to our Patreon exclusives and uh, help us keep it a little weird. Patreon.com slash today. All right, so starting to talk about the Y2K bug. Before I go into my story, was anybody in the mumble room around and remember the Y2K bug? Did you have any? Were you at work at all? Anybody have a story? Are you all too young? Bunch of youngins. Guys, you guys make me feel old. I hate you guys. Well, I was around for it, but it, it went uneventful as far as I was concerned. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah that's how it went for everybody. That's pretty much how it went for everybody. Uh, I had to, I was alive. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, you know, 
I was working at a school district, <clears throat> and uh, we were, our IT department, we had many meetings to discuss it ahead of time. We had to figure out what software from which vendors, a lot of old computers, a lot of stuff to worry about. And then I remember being at home as it hit midnight, and my, my coworker, he and I were going in to check it, so we were just hanging out that night, kind of not really partying because we had to go into work, sitting around watching TV, eating pizza, and when the clock struck midnight... We looked at each other, the lights were on. Like, nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew. Everybody was so freaking out. Everybody was freaking out so bad, you guys. First of all, we thought, okay, it's a good sign the lights are on. That's literally, that, that's the level of thought we were at. Wow, good thing the lights are on. And hey, look, the TV's still going, too. Okay, we probably have a pretty good chance things might be okay at work. Like, we're just kind of sitting there for a few minutes. We get in the car. We drive into work. It's quiet. You know, because how often are you at work, like, on a holiday at, like, midnight one in the morning right dead quiet we get in there everything's perfectly fine not a single problem <laughs> nothing went wrong at all it was the easiest overtime i've ever made and we never had a single fallout uh just just sat there and and just sort of freaked ourselves out and nothing ever happened so I don't know how it came up on the pre-show today, but we're going to try to do an end-of-show theme. So if you've got a great Y2K video that's just a few minutes long or less, please submit it to the subreddit, techtalktoday.reddit.com. We'll play it as an end-of-show clip. Uh, also, join me live tomorrow, jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific, noon Eastern. Jblive is, uh, TV also has an embedded chat room, so you can just chat in the chat room, or you can join us in the mumble room if you do uh, um, uh, bang mumble in our chat room. It'll give you the address. And you can just join and comment on the stories as we go. We'll just do a mic check first, usually. And I'd love to have your input on these stories or your Y2K story if you want to share it with us. So I will end with sort of an introduction to Y2K. I know just about everybody probably knows what it is. Th there, there are a lot of good videos on YouTube about this subject, but only one of them has Leonard Nimoy. So that's the one we're going to play. It's a little bit long, but it really takes you back to the state of mind. And remember, this is from a VHS, so the quality is a little rough. But it takes you back to where we were at and what the state of panic was. And then we'll play some fun videos throughout the week. And this, I mean, after all, this is pretty fun. It's got Leonard freaking Nimoy in it. All right, that wraps it up for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope to see you tomorrow. TechTalkToday.reddit.com to make this show even better. Have a great rest of your day. See you tomorrow. We both enjoy and are awestruck by the unbelievably rapid advancements in human ingenuity and technology. Yet... How fragile do we now find ourselves before the juggernaut of our own inventions? However, as we indicated earlier in this program, there are no Y2K experts. No one knows exactly what, if anything, will happen. And our individual and collective response to Y2K is actually far more important than Y2K itself. The experts that we're dealing with uh, indicate that it's going to hit hard and heavy for a while, maybe be, maybe look like what some are calling a meltdown scenario for a week or two, and then it's going to level out more to brown out. On a scale of one to five, uh, how bad the Y2K is going to be globally, five being the worst, I would say globally they're at a five. In the States, we have been at a four. I think we're going to end up about a two. My personal sense of this is uh, in the range of three. I think there are going to be major disruptions. I think there are going to be uh, things that uh, we can deal with, but it won't be easy. Putting January 1 on a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being the worst and 1 being nothing at all, my assumption is somewhere around a 2.5. Again, an annoyance, a nuisance, a lot of different things that don't work. Catastrophic? I don't think so. I would say a 3. I think maybe we're looking at maybe a three. I think based on the utility companies, I think there will be some power outages or we'll have brownouts in some cases. I would say that it would probably fall around a three or a four. My personal opinion is it can only be a five. It can't be any less than a five. I would probably have to rate this right in the middle at two and a half. And the reason is because we know that this is an inevitable circumstance. I would put the year 2000 problem for the world at a three with a wait and see attitude. In a very real way, we're all responsible for Y2K and there's no one to blame, morally or otherwise. We've all benefited from the technologies which have improved our lives 
and we have therefore encouraged those same technologies to develop at ever more accelerated rates. And yes, perhaps we are now realizing that we've taken them a bit for granted and have indeed become too dependent upon the byproducts of our collective innovations. And so, we must not only prepare as families and work together as neighbors, but we need also use this moment in the development of our civilization as an opportunity to look at the long-range effects of all our human endeavors. Looking beyond Y2K, whatever perils our very human ambitions and short-sightedness may lead us to, our even more powerful human spirit will find a way to overcome. So, let us use the Y2K challenge as an opportunity to reflect on where we're headed as a civilization perhaps the most important opportunity we've ever had. If the omission of two simple digits can have worldwide impact several decades after its inception, we must ask ourselves, before we rush too far forward, what are we doing now in genetic engineering, with cloning, with the development of bacteriological warfare life forms, with death ray technologies, and pollution of land, air, and water that could have long-term, unpredictable worldwide effects? And what can we do as the inheritors, the caretakers of this world? What can we do to protect our home, our island in space?